ABC News Live. Prince William and President Biden met today outside the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library with the Boston Harbor as their background. The Royals in Boston to award this year's environmental Earthshot prizes. Earlier today, Biden signing a bill to avert a potentially catastrophic rail strike with gas prices falling and positive job numbers. But what does it mean for inflation? And amid Kanye West's latest racist tirade, the president speaking out against anti-Semitism, tweeting, silence is complicity. The rogue wave on an Antarctic cruise ship that left one dead and the passenger lucky to be alive after falling off a different boat and surviving nearly 20 hours at sea. I was never accepting that this is it. This is gonna be the end of my life. World Cup fever, the U.S. set for a knockout round matchup against Netherlands, with the injured American hero expected to play. How the flu could impact the game. Newly released body camera video showing the moment a police officer opens fire, killing a man carrying an assault rifle in Austin, Texas. Tonight, the family asking questions. Houston police announcing an arrest in the murder of the rapper Takeoff. What authorities say happened just before the star was gunned down. And tis the season, Full House star John Stamos on how he's teamed up with the Beach Boys to bring fans Christmas cheer to Carnegie Hall this season. I feel like I'm overselling it, but it's, it's heart music and we need it in this world right now. Good evening and thanks for streaming with us. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. We begin with signs of strength, but still lingering questions about the state of the economy as we barrel into the Christmas holidays. One thing we do now know is that there will be no rail strike to cripple commerce. After calling on Congress to act, President Biden signed a bill earlier today at the White House. He did, however, acknowledge the legislation failed to include sick days the workers were seeking. At the same time, brisk hiring in November outpaced expectations. With more than a quarter million jobs added and unemployment still near a 53-year low, wages are also up. And at a time when many Americans are watching their budgets, gas prices have fallen to their lowest level since February of this year, before the Ukraine war help send prices skyrocketing. But the apparent signs of strength are also raising some concern on Wall Street, specifically when it comes to the inflation forecast and what it means for interest rates. Here's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Okay. President Biden today signing a bill to avert what could have been a catastrophic rail strike. Rail shutdown would have devastated our economy. Without freight rail, many of the U.S. industries would literally shut down. But the president acknowledging it falls short of what many rail workers are demanding, paid sick leave. I know this bill doesn't have paid sick leave that these rail workers and frankly every worker in America deserves. But that fight isn't over. Still, Biden praised the bill for avoiding a potential disaster as he welcomed more positive economic news. The cost of gasoline, now $3.47 a gallon. That's the lowest it's been since February, before Russia invaded Ukraine and set off a global energy crisis. Some experts now predicting Americans could see prices below $3 a gallon before the holidays, an unexpected gift. The latest jobs report also better than expected, with the U.S. adding 263,000 jobs in November, driven by gains in leisure, hospitality, health care, and government. Wages are up 2.6% for the month, double the estimate. Wages for working families, I want to say this again, wages for working families, in fact, over the last couple months have gone up, up. But economists are warning that may not be a good thing when it comes to inflation. When wages go up, inflation could as well. And that's the problem. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, even in the strong jobs market, Americans still feeling the pain of inflation. So can you take a minute and explain a bit more what this jobs report means for the economy? Well, Phil, this jobs report really is a double-edged sword. Wages are going up, and that is certainly a good thing. But if they continue to go up, that means that prices could also continue to go up. And that means that the Fed will likely continue down this path of raising interest rates, making it more expensive to borrow. Phil? All right. Mary Bruce from the White House, thank you. Thank you.
President Biden today denouncing anti-Semitism in this country while calling on political leaders to speak out against it. It comes amid a surge in anti-Semitic rhetoric and attacks and growing concern about hate speech on social media altogether. New Twitter CEO Elon Musk suspending the account of Kanye West for recent posts on that platform. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. President Biden today condemned the anti-Semitic rants of Kanye West, and he's calling on other leaders to do the same, tweeting, the Holocaust happened, Hitler was a demonic figure, and instead of giving it a platform, our political leaders should be calling out and rejecting anti-Semitism wherever it hides. Silence is complicity. The president's tweet came after another torrent of anti-Semitic actions by West, who went so far as to praise Adolf Hitler in an interview with fringe right-wing conspiracy theorist Alex Jones and Nick Fuentes, a notorious white supremacist and Holocaust denier. West then tweeted an image of a swastika within a Star of David, prompting Twitter to suspend his account for a second time. Elon Musk tweeting that West, quote, violated our rule against incitement to violence. Just weeks ago, West and Fuentes dined with Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago. Trump has yet to condemn the hateful and anti-Semitic views of either man. Republican Party Chair Ronna McDaniel called West's latest remarks abhorrent, tweeting there is no place for Kanye, Fuentes, or their views inside the Republican Party. McDaniel, however, has not criticized Trump for welcoming the two of them at Mar-a-Lago. The Anti-Defamation League warns anti-Semitic incidents surged to an all-time high last year. More than 2,700 cases of assault, harassment, and vandalism, up 34% from the year before. Time and time again, we have seen how the normalization of anti-Semitic tropes and conspiracies uh, and hatred um, can animate people to action. Yeah, and that is a very real fear. John Carl joins me now from Washington. John, even after this latest offensive tirade from Kanye West, have we heard any criticism of him from former President Trump, who he was just dining with a couple days earlier? No criticism whatsoever from Trump. In fact, uh, Donald Trump, who at this point is the only declared Republican candidate for president in 2024, has not expressed a hint of regret for the dinner at Mar-a-Lago with West and with Fuentes uh, since the initial response to the controversy when he noted that Kanye West had said many nice things about him and, quote, why wouldn't I agree to meet? That's all we've heard from Donald Trump on this. Phil? All right, John Carl, thank you. Thank you. Nearly released body camera video shows the moment a police officer opens fire, killing a man carrying an assault rifle in Texas. Security video shows the suspect firing into a home. Police say he ignored calls to drop his weapon. ABC's Maria Villarreal joins us from Austin, and we do want to warn you, some may find this video disturbing. Tonight, new body camera video shows the moments Austin police fatally shot Raj Munsingi. Draw the gun! It happened on the night of November 15th. Police responding to a 911 call reporting an armed man walking around a home, describing him as paranoid. Security camera footage showing Raj Munsingi at one point pointing an assault style rifle toward the home. Yeah. You want this? Before firing. That's right when police arrive and almost immediately Officer Daniel Sanchez opens fire. I'm on you. Draw the gun! Police rendering aid, but Munsingi died at the hospital. His family says the killing was an unjustified murder. In a statement saying the video clearly shows that Raj never threatened the officers. He didn't even know they were there. Our thanks to Maria for that. What's known as a giant rogue wave slammed into a cruise ship bound for Antarctica this week, killing one passenger, injuring four others. Tonight, passengers share their confusion and fear as that wall of water crashed into the ship without any warning. Here's Will Carr. Tonight, these images revealing the aftermath of a frightening scene aboard an Antarctic cruise. A deadly rogue wave slamming into the Viking Polaris Tuesday night, killing one and injuring four. Argentine authorities telling the Associated Press a 62-year-old American woman did not survive. This video showing the turbulent sea conditions in the hours before that wave struck. Beverly Spiker and her husband Rick were staying in a cabin on the third deck when the wave hit. We heard it smash against our window and a lot of water 
came shooting in. Spiker says other passengers in the rooms below hers recounted being swept out of their beds by the water and having the walls collapse around them. The ship was sailing towards Argentina, making its way through Drake Passage when the wave hit. That passage, the gateway to the Antarctic and one of the world's roughest waterways. It almost felt like a rocket had hit the ship. Alexandra Pearson on vacation with her dad. They're both okay tonight telling me. I'm still a little shook up and I had a nightmare last night and woke up and was like, where's my dad? Yeah, completely understandable and, and terrifying. Will Carr joins us now. Will, where are those passengers tonight? Bill, tonight some of those passengers are in hotels. Others are still on board that ship trying to salvage what's left of their trips. It comes as we've received a statement from Viking. They're offering their deepest sympathies and help with any return travel for everybody who is still on board. Bill. All right, Will Carr, thank you. Next to that major cross-country storm, two dozen states under alerts tonight from the west all the way to New York. Heavy snow, dangerous wind, driving rain for the northeast, then the bitter cold right behind it. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Phil. This has really been a high-impact storm throughout the West, and uh, most of that energy, in the form of wind at least, is going to get over the Rockies. We still have high wind warnings that are posted for the high plains there in Colorado and uh, parts of Kansas and Nebraska. But look at the wind advisories. All that brown area from the central U.S., the heartland, the Great Lakes, all the way in through upstate New York could see 40 to 50 mile an hour wind gusts with this thing. All right, still snowing a little bit with avalanche warnings in the Rockies. A little pulse of snow coming with the center of this low across the upper Midwest. Won't be a lot, but just, you know, three or four or five inches in Spots, really picking up the moisture as that front crosses the Mississippi. And tomorrow morning, the rains will begin to increase from the Mid-Atlantic up through D.C. and uh, Baltimore and Philly, up I-95, New York, up through uh, Bridgeport and Providence, Albany getting some heavy rain, as will uh, parts of New England, and then tapering off somewhat before that front clicks through tomorrow evening. And once that happens, not only does everybody get clear, but everybody gets cold and windy. Wind chills in the morning on Sunday, looking like minus 2 in Duluth, but 11 degrees in, in Chicago. It'll be 16 in Lincoln. It'll feel like 22 degrees in Cincinnati, so not a picnic there. Uh, these temps are about 10 to 15 degrees below average, but a, a solid reminder, Phil, that uh, we're now in December, and winter is here. Phil? Indeed we are. All right, Rob, thank you. A busy day in Boston for the Royals today as Prince William meets with President Biden and Princess Catherine has a solo engagement. ABC's Trevor Alt has more from Boston. Tonight, President Biden greeting Prince William at the JFK Library in Boston on day three of the royal visit to America. <laughs> Meanwhile, Princess Catherine cheered on her first solo engagement of this royal tour, visiting the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard. Earlier, the prince meeting other American royalty, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy and two of her children, Tatiana and Jack Schlossberg. William says his Earthshot initiative to stop climate change was inspired by Caroline's father, President John F. Kennedy's moonshot. The Wales is rounding out their trip with tonight's prize ceremony, but the event and the royal couple's first trip to the U.S. since 2014 somewhat overshadowed by controversy at home over accusations of racism by Prince William's godmother at a recent event. When the stakes were this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? And the release of this trailer promoting Harry and Meghan's intimate Netflix documentary, with critics suggesting the timing was deliberate to coincide with William and Catherine's tour. And Trevor Alt joins us now from Boston. Trevor, what's next for the Royals? So what's next is they're going to head back to the U.K., Phil, despite all the controversy over the past few days. Tonight's event pressed forward with enthusiasm. Looks like it's just wrapping up now. I see some people starting to leave on the remnants of the green carpet there and millions of dollars now going toward the fight against climate change. Phil. All right, Trevor All from Boston. Thank you. It was another exciting day at FIFA's World Cup with four more teams officially punching their ticket to the elimination round. Perhaps the most surprising, South Korea, and we'll have more on that in just a moment. But first, it's all eyes on the big match for Team USA tomorrow in the round of 16. So we want to bring in USA Today reporter Christine Brennan. Christine, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Sure, so Great to be with you, Phil. Thank you. Christian Pulisic is a go for tomorrow against the Netherlands, and it looks like some players on the Netherlands have the flu. Of course, that affects how people play. Do you think uh, Team USA can get to the, uh, the, the quarterfinals for the first time in decades? Yeah, first time in, since 2002 if they were to pull it off, and the answer is yes. I do think that 
Obviously, American sports fans want to see that. They're going to be willing this team, this young American team that has really captured the hearts of so many people in the country. They're going to be willing them to, to pull it off. You know, the, the U.S. has not allowed a goal in the run of play. The only goal they've given up in those first three matches was a penalty kick. And so it's a smothering defense that the United States has, has worked to its advantage against Wales and England and Iran. Obviously, this is another step up. I mean, England's excellent, but another step up, and that is the Netherlands. Eighth ranked in the world, probably the best nation, soccer, men's soccer nation in the world to never win a World Cup. Hmm. And even if they're, if they're, some of the players are not healthy, that, that could be huge. You know, we will see how that plays out. Let's quickly talk about some of the action today. South Korea finished there was epic. Uh, what stood out to you? You know, the South Korean uh, team, I think, you know, what we've seen there, there are a lot of upsets. And uh, South Korea hosted the World Cup uh, several World Cups ago. Um, surprised me in some ways, but then I think the fact is we shouldn't be surprised. I'd like to get your take on this as the field of 16 is now set. Who is your odds-on favorite to win it all? And what team do you think might surprise people? <laughs> Phil, I've been saying Brazil um, just because it's not exactly an out there kind of pick. It's right. really the most logical pick. <laughs> the Brazilian men have won five World Cups, but it's been 20 years since they've won one. And Neymar has been injured. If he gets back, if he's healthy, I think Brazil is the team to beat, although France is also looking very, very good. And France and Brazil could face each other in the final, the way the draw is working out. And then, you know, as far as... Uh, you know, a team that's surprising. You know, I, you, the U.S. certainly would be right up there, obviously, as an American journalist. But, you know, they have been excellent to watch. And, you know, I, I think, to, you know, England has so much pressure on them, always. Uh, the Brits, you know, just throw that on them. I think that's, uh, you know, a team, obviously, to watch as well. All right. Well, in American football, we say any given Sunday. Um, finally, as we close this week out, I just really want to get your take on this. It's important to note that for many, the significance of these games goes far beyond the field. Uh, this moment, specifically, of sportsmanship after the U.S. Uh, one Tuesday got our eye. U.S. player Anthony Robinson uh, hugging an Iranian player after the U.S. ended Iran's World Cup. Hopes the Iranian player now faces, obviously, an uncertain future uh, back home, as many do. Do. do moments like this, uh, well, I, definitely moments like this show us the power of sports, but this particular moment on this particular stage with what's happening now in these countries? Oh, without a doubt. That encapsulates, I think, in many ways, not only the moment and the, the, the temperature and the, the scene around the world, but also I think it's one of the reasons why this team is around the country and really around the world, the Americans have really captured people's attention and, and the hearts of a lot of, of, of fans the hugging that wasn't just about, we're sorry, you know, you lost, or we feel, and we, you know, consoling you. It was because, as we know, there have been threats of punishment and worse against the families of the Iranian players because they had the courage, the bravery, to not sing their national anthem in that first match, which, of course, was seen as a sign of solidarity with the protesters in Iran over women's rights and, and so many other issues. And so, there the Americans were saying, you know, we're with you, we understand, and we feel for you. And that's that's really uh, remarkable, it's admirable, and again, it seems to be the storyline for this U.S. team as they look out for others and look out for more than just themselves and this incredible story, this geopolitical, social political story that is part of this World Cup. And I'm just saying it would be great if it was one part of the story as this team, you know, takes home the World Cup for the first time in, what, 20 years. Christine Brennan, thank you so much. Do appreciate it. My pleasure, Phil. Thank you. And when we come back, stunning moments when a semi-truck falls off a highway and lands on top of another crash scene. He has a hit TV show, his own special sandwich now, and a Christmas concert with the Beach Boys. John Stamos talks about his next act. But first, 20 hours spent treading water in the Gulf of Mexico. One man sharing his incredible story of survival after falling off a cruise ship and the miraculous rescue that came just as his body was giving out. This is ABC News Live. 
is the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. He was just elected to replace her and lead the House Democrats. Now, Sunday morning, the only place to see Hakeem Jeffries is on This Week. How will he lead the charge against the Republican majority? Plus, new shocking answers on his crypto crash. Sunday on ABC's This Week. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Take a look at this dramatic video out of California today as police work a crash site involving a truck and an SUV. A semi-truck flips over the highway guardrail and lands on top of that accident scene. Police say there have been three crashes in that particular area since last night alone caused by the rainy weather. One person was taken to the hospital. Now to our ABC News exclusive interview with the Alabama man who spent 20 hours treading water in the Gulf of Mexico after falling from a cruise ship. He's sharing his incredible story of survival. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has it. It was a Thanksgiving to remember. James Michael Grimes knows he's lucky to be alive. My worst fear is drowning, and that was something I did not want to have to face. The 28-year-old going overboard a cruise ship in the middle of the night, saying he spent about 20 hours treading water alone in the Gulf of Mexico. I wanted to see my family, and I was dead set on making it out of there. You know, I was never accepting that this is it. This is going to be the end of my life. It was supposed to be a Thanksgiving celebration. James Michael and 18 of his family members boarding the Carnival Valor last Wednesday in New Orleans. We were just hanging out, having a good time, watching some live music. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Did you have a few drinks? Uh, I had during the day. And I would actually did like an air guitar solo. And there was a competition they were doing, and I'd won it, so I'd won a free drink. So I had that, but. Uh-oh. This is utilizing it. But you hadn't had, like, you weren't, like, inebriated, had, like, a ton of drinks. No, ma'am. No. How many drinks do you think you'd had? Uh, it's, I couldn't really say. 
Around 11 p.m. that first night on board, James Michael told his sister he was going to the bathroom. What happened next is still unclear. Do you remember leaving and going to find the bathroom? No, ma'am. Do you remember falling off the boat? No. So you don't know how it happened? No, ma'am. I came to regain consciousness. I was in the water with no boat in sight. So you, for a while, were passed out in the water? Yes, ma'am. Yep. And I can't float myself even when I'm trying to. So there had to be, you know, the Lord was with me when I was out there because something was holding me up the whole time while I was passed out. The next day when he hadn't returned to his cabin, his family alerted the ship's crew. At 2.30, more than 12 hours after James Michael was last seen, Carnival notified the Coast Guard of a missing passenger. We did have a, a fairly significant search area. It was a potential of over 7,000 miles of ocean we had to search. James Michael was alone in an area known to be a feeding ground for sharks. I thought it was a shark. I mean, I was swimming in one direction, and I looked around, and I seen it at the corner of my eye, and it came up on me really quick. I went under and I could see it and it wasn't a shark, I don't believe, but it had more like a flat mouth and it came up and bumped one of my legs and I kicked it with the other leg. It scared me not knowing what it was or at the time how big it was. All I could see was a fin. The avid outdoorsman tried to stay positive and calm, exhausted and hungry. He ate what he could find to maintain his energy. A stick come floating by, it looked like bamboo. So I started eating on it, and it actually, I mean, I'm not going to say it tasted good, but it gave some type of flavor in my mouth other than salt water. Was there any point while you were out there where you thought, I, I, I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this? When it started going, getting back towards nighttime again, the water started getting colder. At that time, I thought, you know, how much longer am I going to have to be out here? Yeah, but you just kept swimming? Yes, ma'am. You know, I... The fall didn't kill me. You know, sea creatures didn't eat me. I felt like I was meant to get out of there. As the sun was going down Thanksgiving night, James Michael says he spotted a glimmer of hope, the lights from a tanker ship, and decided to swim towards it. That was my final little burst of energy. The strength that I had, I used pretty much every bit of it too try to make it to one of them. The Coast Guard then arriving, his miraculous rescue captured on camera. When the Coast Guard got there, yeah. what happened? Uh, they circled the boat two or three times looking for me. And, you know, I was, I'd done taking off my socks and everything and was just waving them around my head, trying to do something where they could see me. And when that light finally hit me, somehow I heard, we got him. And I seen a guy coming down from that helicopter, and it was coming towards me. You know, right then I thought, man, this is, I, I see the light. When the Coast Guard guy showed up in the water, what'd you say to him? <laughs> well, the first thing I actually told him was, I don't have any clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't. <laughs> I didn't strip out of everything. He said, that's fine. All right, and I was just like, okay. And he told me to hold on to this life vessel, and I was just thinking, thank you. You know, you're like a guardian angel coming down for me. His rescuers believe he was seconds away from not making it. I swam to him as fast as I could. Um, as I got to him, I shoved the rescue sling under his arms and he collapsed into it. He, he had nothing left. James Michael says the whole experience has given him new purpose. These were actually the pants that I'd plan on wearing on the cruise but never got to, and I put them on this morning, and I reached in the pocket, and there was something, it was a fortune, and it says, life's a beach, enjoy the waves. Do you think it changed you? Yes, definitely. It opened my eyes. Uh, to, I take things for granted, I reckon, or a lot of people do. Do you think you'll go on a cruise ship again? Yeah, I will. Really? Yeah, I ain't gonna let it discourage me that much. Uh, I might not get within 10 foot of the rails, but I'd definitely be open to going on another cruise because I really didn't get to go on this one. Fair. What an amazing story. Eva, thank you for that. Still ahead here on Prime, an update on an American imprisoned in Russia whose family had lost contact with him. A new development in the search for a suspect in the killing of Migos rapper Takeoff. And 
we look at the disappointing holiday box office earnings. We're going to do that by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Paris Hilton wishing her longtime friend Britney Spears a happy birthday. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs and some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The holiday stretch is traditionally a time for Americans to hit the theaters. And while Christmas releases do await, it was certainly no feast at the movies this Thanksgiving. So here's box office blues by the numbers. The total box office sales over the five-day Thanksgiving period came in at under $100 million. $95 million was the final haul. If you take the two pandemic Thanksgivings out, you'd have to go back nearly three decades to 1994 for such a dismal turnout. In 2019, before COVID shut down theaters, Total sales topped $180 million, propelled by the, the seasonal smash hit Frozen 2. This year, another Disney sequel, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, did find an audience earning $64 million over that holiday period. But Disney's animated fantasy film, Strange World, met another fate, slumping to less than $19 million. Even Steven Spielberg failed to connect. His coming-of-age family drama, The Fablemans, brought home just $3.1 million over the break. So can Christmas right the ship? Buzz is building for Avatar, The Way of Water, the sequel to the 2009 blockbuster, which remains, by the way, the highest-grossing film of all time at nearly $3 billion worldwide. Nine months after that slap shock at the Oscars, Will Smith We'll be back on the big screen this month in Emancipation. We'll see how moviegoers respond to that. And while movie theaters were quiet, Broadway theaters were not. Ticket sales for the 33 productions over Thanksgiving were reportedly up 22% this year. 
We still have a lot to get to here on Prime, how a music tour is leading to numerous investigations and calls to break up a powerful company, and why one of the cast members of the Squid Game is set to appear before a judge. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs, and some good food. You got me feeling like you know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So, join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. He was just elected to replace her and lead the House Democrats. Now, Sunday morning, the only place to see Hakeem Jeffries is on This Week. How will he lead the charge against the Republican majority? Plus, new shocking answers on his crypto crash. Sunday on ABC's This Week. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime. Cinematic. Real-life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. After days of negotiations and votes on Capitol Hill, President Biden signed a bipartisan measure averting a coast-to-coast -coast rail strike weeks before the holidays. The legislation requires rail workers accept a tentative agreement the White House helped broker earlier this year. It calls for a $16,000 immediate payout with wage and benefit increases up to $160,000, a 24% pay raise, $5,000 performance bonuses, maintaining access to health care plans and an additional day of paid personal leave. Sick leave, a major sticking point in contract talks. The House passed a measure to give the rail workers seven days of paid sick leave, but it failed in the Senate. President Biden pledging to keep up the fight. But we still have more work to do, in my view, in terms of uh, ultimately getting uh, paid sick leave, not just for rail workers, but for every worker in America. Today marked the last day of early voting for a tight Georgia Senate runoff. Incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock is locked in a battle against Republican nominee Herschel Walker, with Democrats hoping to add a 51st seat in the U.S. Senate. Early voting has seen historic lines at polling places in Georgia, and Election Day is Tuesday. Meanwhile, a rural Arizona county that refused to certify its election results has now done so upon orders from a federal judge. The Republican-led Board of Supervisors in Cochise County had held off on certifying the results for weeks, despite no evidence of malfeasance. 
Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones has filed for bankruptcy. Jones filed for bankruptcy after a jury in Connecticut decided he and his company should pay nearly a billion dollars for defaming families linked to the 2012 mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Creditors on the bankruptcy court filing included some of the families Jones defamed by calling the massacre a hoax. His company, Free Speech Systems, filed for bankruptcy protection in July, and Jones has mocked the verdicts against him by saying he has no ability to pay. New developments in the shooting death of hip-hop star Takeoff of the Atlanta rap group Migos. Houston police announcing they've arrested 33-year-old Patrick Clark and charged him with murder. Made a promise that we would get the individuals or the individual that's responsible uh, for the murder of Takeoff in custody. The break comes just days after Houston police arrested 22-year-old Cameron Joshua on gun charges, accused of illegally having a gun where Takeoff was killed. Video obtained by TMZ shows the argument that led up to the shooting, followed by the sound of gunfire and people running. Takeoff was often praised for his peaceful demeanor. He formed the rap group Migos in 2008 with relatives Quavo and Offset. Police in Raleigh, North Carolina, released dramatic body camera video of the standoff with a 15-year-old suspect following a mass shooting. The video, which takes place after the shooting, shows officers surrounding a building in a wooded area where the suspect, Austin Thompson, was hiding before he and officers exchanged gunfire. Police also showing video from an officer hit in the knee during the gunfire with surrounding officers helping him. Get to get on the right knee. Officers surrounded the building so Thompson couldn't get away. He was eventually taken into custody. Five people were killed and two others injured in the October 13th shooting. A man found dead on a New York City sidewalk has been identified as an actor who appeared in the Oscar-winning film Green Book. Frank Bellalonga Jr.'s body was found Monday in the Bronx. No cause of death has been determined. One man was taken into custody on charges of concealment of a human corpse in relation to Bellalonga's death. The actor was the son of Frank Bellalonga Sr., known as Tony Lip, who was portrayed in Green Book by Vigo Mortensen. Bellalonga Jr. played a relative of Tony Lips in the film and had a number of other credits in movies and television shows. He was 60 years old. We are also tracking several headlines around the world at this hour. A new round of Russian airstrikes in eastern Ukraine obliterated an apartment block in the Kharkiv region as Russia's relentless airstrikes on Ukraine's infrastructure have crippled the country's power grid just as winter sets in. And 24 hours after President Biden said he would talk to Vladimir Putin if Russia was ready to end the war and pull troops out, today the Kremlin rejected those conditions. Paul Whelan's twin brother, David, says that Paul has called his family for the first time since he dropped out of contact last week while being detained in Russia. Whelan called his family from the prison hospital but did not explain why he was there or why he had been prevented from calling his family since before Thanksgiving. Whelan also spoke to U.S. officials, according to the State Department, and convened, uh, conveyed rather that he was feeling well. Award-winning Squid Game actor Oh Young Soo is set to stand trial in February on charges of indecent assault after a woman accused him of inappropriately touching her back in 2017. South Korean court said that prosecutors indicted the 78-year-old Emmy nominee last week. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but there is some bad blood tonight between Taylor Swift fans and Ticketmaster. The ticketing giant was unable to meet the unprecedented demand for tickets to the star's first concert tour since 2018, launching investigations now and sounding calls to break up the powerful entertainment company. Ashan Singh has the story. Take me to day one of the pre-sale day. Yeah. Did you even get a code? Yes, yeah, so I did. I did get a code. So what went wrong? Everything. Mine crashed immediately. <sighs> Trying hard to keep my morale high. And then it finally pops up and loads, and it does the, you know, there's 2,000 plus people in front of you. What's going through your head at this point? I'm kind of panicked. <gasps> First, there was the anticipation. <laughs> but when the queue opened up to finally buy tickets for Taylor Swift's upcoming stadium tour, for fans, the Swifties went from freaking out. Are you joking? What? <laughs> to melting down. The tickets you have selected have been released. Ah! The line has stopped moving. The website fully crashed. I waited in line. 
for like six hours. Now, Ticketmaster, the company responsible for selling these tickets, is facing increased scrutiny, with fans and government officials demanding answers on what many claim are unfair practices. All of that chaos was triggered by Taylor Swift's November 1st announcement. And I finally get to tell you, I'm going back on tour. Her big news came just days after she dropped her record-breaking album, Midnights, which filled all top 10 spots on the Billboard charts with inescapable hits like Antihero. It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. This will be the first time Taylor's hit the road since her 2018 Reputation Stadium Tour. Featured in the Netflix movie of the same name. People are really just hungry to see Taylor Swift perform live. Her fans are incredibly devoted. They're incredibly passionate, and that is to her credit. Hey, when she says she cares about her fans, we're talking about an artist who literally has baked them cookies. People have not been able to see the artists that they've wanted to see perform because of the pandemic. Major artists are now announcing tours. People have to figure this out and get it together. But the Swifties took it to a whole other level of demand. So one of the biggest frustrations about this ticket sale is Taylor Swift fans were led to believe that they specifically had multiple avenues to be able to secure tickets to the tour. So we're right outside Columbus, Ohio right now to link up with super fan Nicole Hallberg, who says she checked all those boxes. So let's see if she was able to get tickets. So I'm looking at your desk over here, and it looks a bit more like a Taylor shrine than a desk. I would say that is correct. <laughs> I mean, we have everything, even water bottles. It's 11.30, and my line hasn't moved in an hour. Like many fans, Nicole wasn't able to get a ticket during the fan presale, but she had a Capital One credit card, which let her get into another special presale just one day later. I started with the Cincinnati show, couldn't get any tickets. I tried Arizona, I tried LA, I tried Seattle, I tried Chicago. I mean, I must have went to probably eight different cities. And then Ticketmaster canceled the general sale, Nicole's last chance at tickets, due to, quote, insufficient remaining ticket inventory. It was just gone. Mm -hmm. like a, And that was a very hard reality to, to accept. Does any part of you blame Taylor? You can't look at Taylor and, and say that she's just the artist. She doesn't have control. She is Taylor the businesswoman. She's Taylor the corporation. I'm so upset right now because I was in line for Taylor with tickets. As more fans lost out on tickets, they started looking for someone or something to blame. This was a terrible experience. I'm really disappointed. And a lot of them looked at Ticketmaster. All of these things were preventable. Days following the incident, Taylor put out a statement on her Instagram story, never naming Ticketmaster, but writing in part, I'm not going to make excuses for anyone because we asked them multiple times if they could handle this kind of demand, and we were assured they could. Adding in reference to her fans, it really pisses me off that a lot of them feel like they went through several bear attacks to get them. Representatives for Ticketmaster, though, said there was just no way to prepare for all these buyers. On CNBC's Squawk on the Street, the CEO of Liberty Media, a majority stakeholder in Ticketmaster, said, All the Live Nation team is sympathetic that the long wait times and fans who couldn't get what they wanted. The site was supposed to be opened up for 1.5 million verified Taylor Swift fans. Uh, we had 14 million people hit the site, including bots. We could have filled 900 stadiums. Everybody knew going into this there weren't going to be enough tickets for all the buyers. But what people wanted was a fair process where they felt like they at least had the opportunity to get them. Two weeks after tickets went on sale, we still don't have any idea how many are left or if they'll go back on sale. Because people have this personal connection with Taylor and because individuals who want to resell the tickets to the people who want to go out to the shows, that's why we have this particular problem. Ticketmaster does have a tool to try to slow down the ticket resale market called dynamic pricing. The idea behind dynamic pricing is to match the real market value of the tickets. So if a particular artist is exceptionally popular, the tickets are priced a little bit higher right away because there's an algorithm that recognizes that tickets that might otherwise cost, let's say, $100 
could theoretically be sold on the secondary market for $1,000 or maybe two or three times that. So dynamic pricing allows the artist to capture this revenue herself rather than simply see someone who's sitting in front of a computer, has nothing to do with the show, contributes nothing artistically, make that profit by buying the ticket and then reselling it. There's been speculation that Taylor was using dynamic pricing this tour, but for the first time, her team is speaking out. A spokesperson told Impact exclusively that, quote, Taylor chose not to use and will not use dynamic or platinum pricing on Taylor Swift, the Eras tour. Over the years, Ticketmaster has only gotten more powerful, especially after a 2010 merger with mega promoter Live Nation. When you have this kind of monopoly power, when you have no competition, it discourages innovation, it degrades quality, it produces higher prices, all those things which are very harmful to consumers and to the quality of life that my constituents uh, live and the quality of life of people all across this country. According to Yale School of Management, Ticketmaster currently controls over 70% of the market for ticketing and live events. You have the world's largest concert promoter that owns the world's largest ticketing company that also has a management group with about 100 managers and 450 of the world's best known and most talented artists. And this same company owns and operates venues. To a lot of people, this looks very much like uh, a vertical monopoly. The New York Times is reporting that the Justice Department is actually already looking into the company. They've been asking around for months about whether Ticketmaster engages in monopolistic practices. Ticketmaster has a hugely dominant market position, so we're looking at this from both a consumer protection and antitrust perspective. Even Jonathan Scrimetti, the Attorney General of Taylor's home state, is investigating the issue. The concern is there is a huge incentive for people to game this system, and tickets in the tens of thousands of dollars appear to be somewhat common. Uh, so there's a huge markup here, and where people have that kind of incentive, we have to be awfully careful to make sure that there's nobody putting a thumb on the scales and getting a cut of that. Ticketmaster's parent company, Live Nation, defended itself in a November 19th statement, saying, Live Nation takes its responsibilities under the antitrust law seriously, and does not engage in behaviors that would require it to alter fundamental business practices. They also said it has a significant share of the primary ticketing services market because of the large gap that exists between the quality of the Ticketmaster system and the next best primary ticketing system. That Ticketmaster continues to be the leader in such an environment is a testament to the platform and those who operate it, not to any anti-competitive business practices. You can't call this the straw that broke the camel's back because the camel was broken. What happened is all of a sudden a bunch of kids saw the camel in pain <laughs> and that's not good. What I do know is Ticketmaster or whomever else has to figure out how to solve this before Beyonce announces her tour. Because if you think the Swifties are bad, the Beehive, you don't want to mess with the Beehive. He has starred in dozens of TV shows and films since the 1980s and is known basically everywhere for his role as Uncle Jesse on Full House. But he's also an accomplished musician. And Monday night, he'll actually be performing with the Beach Boys at Carnegie Hall in New York City for a special Christmas concert. John Stamos is who we're talking about. And he joins us now, what, ready to play for us? Is that what you uh, yeah, can we hear? Yeah, how you doing, Phil? I hear you're into guitars, right? You I guitar love player? guitars. And we have to start. Mm -hmm. I got it. The room, you have the best Zoom background of all time. Guitars this on the wall. This is my bathroom. This is your bathroom, this yeah. This is my bathroom. Gibson. So, they had a lot of Gibson guitars. This is uh, those, t t the gold one and the red uh, top, I played on full, they're from Full House. Mm. And the middle one is was Bob Saget's guitar. He gave it, uh, his, wife, his wife gave it to me. You mentioned Bob, but just before we get into the interview, I wasn't planning on asking you, but um, how are you doing? How is his family doing? We know you two are good friends. I'm doing fine, it, you know, um, it's still very hard to believe and it's we're coming up on a year, so I was done putting something together for that. It's it's awful, I don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's I, I come from a place where it's just take the hit and not try to avoid it, but I feel like I've been taking it for a while now and there's very little relief other than I just, I think about him all the time and I think about, you know, Right now, he's probably saying, "Say, tell people how handsome I was, and tell, talk about me more." <laughs> right. But I'm. 
Well, that's so, how every, that's how everybody lives on, especially when they're gone too soon. Sure, so, yeah. thanks for sharing that, and and um, our best to his family. Uh, let's begin Thank with you. you with the music. You're performing with the Beach okay. Boys Monday night, and you've joined up with yes. them before. Of course, you, you, their relationship goes back uh, to the early days of Full House. Tell us about how that happened and, and what you're looking forward to Monday night. Well, for, are you coming, by the way, Phil? If you're inviting me and you'll put me on a list, I feel like I'm overselling it, but. It's it's heart music, and we need it in this world right now. So you know, please come and and if uh, if you're out there and you want to come, there's still tickets. Please come see the show. It's a beautiful, beautiful show. And I met them. Well, I was I stalked them when I was. I love the Beach Boys were my all time favorite. They still are. And I um, uh, a friend of mine uh, I knew who was playing guitar with the band, and I went to see them. And uh, I was on General Hospital at the time, and it was at a baseball stadium. And all these girls chased me into the backstage and. <laughs> Uh, Mike Love said, who's that? And my friend Jeff said, that's John Stamos. And he's on a soap opera. And, and uh, Mike said, the girls scream and chase after him all the time. And Jeff said, yeah. He goes, get him on stage. <laughs> and I went up and played Barbara Ann and I've been playing with him ever since. Yeah, well, you, you're our rock star everywhere you go, it seems. I think one of those girls chasing you is our producer, Emily. I'm just saying. Oh, she, hi, Emily. I, I know that there, there's a little bit of a tribute to, to Bob in this uh, series you're starring in, Big Shot. On Disney oh, Plus, yes, right. you play a coach, a basketball team, a, a private girls' school. There are some changes in the second season, a little bit more in in depth with some things that I know you've championed. I'm not a sports guy at all, like you, Phil. I'm a, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> I David play Kelly, oh, you do? <laughs> David yeah. Kelly was uh, wrote this, and you know how he, you know his writing. And I just I remember seeing the pilot, going, "Wow, I have to do the show." The first season was did great. Second season, um, we did, you know. I wanted to bring the girls in more, and then we started thinking, like, well, what's what are teenagers going through? But um, so there's a lot of anxiety, I think, these days with kids, which I feel, you know, I feel for depression. So we deal with a little bit of that, and then I do. We do an episode at the end where my coach and my mentor dies, and it's sort of and gets this all this love and all these great things he did, and, like Bob. And I start to think, like, what am I leaving behind? What's my legacy? And it really becomes about me and my daughter, and you know and that. But it's sort of a, it was a, it was a, inspired by Bob's uh, death. You talk about your daughter on the show, but your son in, in in real life, four years old. I'm paranoid. I'm like, don't touch that, do that. Uh, it's the light. He's the light of my life. I I yeah. knew I always wanted kids, and it's just it's even better than I thought. He's funny. I love that. Uh, I got to ask you about the sandwich. This 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 sandwich oh, that is yes, named. Yeah, yeah. It's it's named the uh, heartthrob cob. How did that come about? I mean, I know the heartthrob. I get it. You're a good-looking man. Well, but how did the cob come up? Well, first of all, I didn't name it the heartthrob. I would okay. I, I, I couldn't. Name. I couldn't rhyme anything with X Teen Idol, so they came up with the heartthrob part. I've been working with this this uh, company, Oral Wheat, for a little while now. I like the cob salad at the Brown Derby in in uh, Florida, and then I was like, how do I get that into Oral Wheat? So it's just so I make the the. Um, Cop salad, and I put it on the orrery bread, the small sliced bread there. My mother-in-law is uh, lost 40 pounds eating their keto bread, too. Hey, John, yeah, thanks, thanks so much. What a pleasure to talk to you. We appreciate you taking the time. Best of luck with everything, especially the family. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting you on Monday. Please go buy these tickets. I think there's some tickets left. It's a wonderful show. Look forward to it. Hey, thanks, Bill. It'll be my first Beach Boy show. Uh, before we go tonight, the image of the day. Check this out. It is a remarkable sight. It's the largest naturalization ceremony ever for Marine Corps Infantry Battalion. 18 active duty Marines were sworn in as U.S. citizens during a ceremony aboard the retired USS North Carolina in Wilmington. They all belong to the 1st Battalion and come from 14 countries on five continents. Our congratulations to each and every one of them and, of course, our thanks for their service. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.